Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship service this morning. My name is Pastor Dan, and I am the pastor here at Rexmont EC Church in Rexmont, Pennsylvania, in the uh, southern end of beautiful Lebanon County. I want to welcome you to our worship service this morning. We are continuing in our series on the book of James, and we are looking at James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26 this morning. And so if you want to turn in your Bibles and follow along as we go through it, it uh, should be a good, good lesson this morning. The <clears throat> Protestant Reformation began in 1517 when Martin Luther took his 95 theses, 95 things he was willing to debate with anyone about Christianity, and he nailed them on the front door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg, Germany. And people began to understand that there were some big discrepancies in the way that Christianity was being taught and lived by the Catholic Church of that time. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, John Calvin in France, Hilrich Zwingli in Switzerland, John Knox in Scotland, sought to bring Christianity back to what the Bible actually taught, rather than relying on what the priests in the church claimed it said. In Latin, the word sola means alone. We get, our, you know, solo is, is our English word. Sola is Latin. And the Protestant Reformation came up with five alone statements that could summarize Christianity. I realize it seems kind of strange to say these are things that are alone, and there's five of them. But that's, that's how it works. Uh, the first one that they come up with is sola grata, grace alone. Salvation is from judgment and condemnation of God that every human being deserves because we're sinners is a gift of grace from God. It has nothing to do with human merit. We aren't saved because of anything we do. There's nothing we can do to gain salvation. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 tells us that. It says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, the second sola is sola fide, faith alone. Uh, the biblical truth that we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone is what sets Christianity apart from all the other religions in the world. It's not by the believer's work or efforts, but by Christ's work on the cross that a person is saved. Romans 5, 8, and 9. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? The third sola is sola Christus, Christ alone. Salvation is found in Christ alone. No human being can forgive sins. It is Christ alone who saves. John 14, 6, Jesus answers, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Uh, the fourth sola, sola scriptura, in scripture alone. The Bible is the sole authority for Christians in faith, doctrine, and practice. In Scripture alone acknowledges the fact that the Bible is the Word of God, inerrant, sufficient, without error, and the source of all truth. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The last sola is sola deo gloria, for God's glory alone. Uh, 
Salvation is wholly a work of God for his glory. Believers contribute nothing to their salvation. Because Christ is both Lord and Savior of believers, they're commanded to live lives that glorify God. 1 Corinthians 10, 3. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Hold on to these five uh, solas. They, they may become a sermon series coming up. We could uh, spend weeks looking at each one of these very, very true statements, examining, examining them, picking them apart, and, and to see what they mean for us as Christians. I, I think that would be a lot of fun. Martin Luther, particularly in his studies and writings, began really to focus in on that second sola, sola fide, in faith alone. And that's probably why Martin Luther didn't particularly like the book of James. And if he didn't like the book of James, he probably really didn't like <clears throat> James 2, 14 to 25. <clears throat> which is the <coughs> excuse me, which is the passage we're going to look at today. Please turn in your Bibles to to that passage, James two fourteen through twenty five, and follow along. I'm going to read the whole thing right now, so we get an overview of what we're going to be talking about. James two fourteen to twenty five. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep well and warm fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, is, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made by complete, was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. When I was in college, I had a friend who struggled with his salvation. He had uh, accepted Christ, and uh, but but he was from a very um, fundamental, very legalistic family, very legalistic church tradition, <clears throat> and he had the mistaken understanding that every time he sinned, he would lose his salvation, and he would have to ask God back into his heart and back into his life every time he committed a sin. And uh, me and my friends who were uh, a little bit uh, more um, spiritually mature uh, tried to help him see that that was not the case, that, that you don't lose your salvation just because you sin. Um, God forgives us our sins. He cleanses us from righteousness. Yes, we make mistakes, but that's why we can go to God and ask forgiveness. He doesn't toss us out of the kingdom of, uh, out of his family just because we do one minor sin. And we, he, this, my friend just struggled with that. And so what we did, I, I thought this was pretty neat. We, he, he prayed the sinner's prayer again. 
And then we took a cross, a little wooden cross, and we took it outside to a tree right outside of the house where we were living. And we nailed that cross to that tree as, as kind of a reminder to him that, that he'd nailed his sins to that cross. And he didn't have to worry about losing his salvation. In fact, if he was worried about losing salvation, it was a good indication that he hadn't. Um, <clears throat> and um, so, so every time he, he started to doubt his salvation, he could just look outside and see that cross and say, yes, I committed my life to Christ. I don't have to worry about losing my salvation. And for him, it was a valuable and kind of a hook to remind him that he was absolutely saved. I remember when I got saved, um, I was first grade, second grade, I don't know which, but I, I do know um, we've been living in Kenya for a couple of years and we'd come back to the United States, uh, mom and dad. My dad was pastoring our uh, Bethesda Reedsville EC church up in Schuylkill County. And I remember one Sunday evening, um, I, cause, cause I was the pastor's kid. So you had to be at church every time the doors were open and, uh, it was a Sunday evening service. I was in first and second grade. Like I said, I don't know. I don't remember the exact date or anything like that. Some people do. I, I don't, I just remember it was during those two years and, uh, <clears throat> dad was preaching his Sunday evening service and that, at Reedsville church, they had a little balcony area up above the back. Um, narthex of the church and i i tended to wander up there during services to be able to play and do stuff without disturbing people too much and uh, i but i remember dad giving a a a a call to repentance and a an altar call that anyone who wanted to come and give their life to christ they could do that and i remember it affecting me and so i worked my way down from the balcony and into the church sanctuary itself and up to the front. And I, I accepted Christ as my savior there in first or second grade. Uh, to be honest, a, a lot of people point to a past decision in, in seeking assurance of salvation. You know, Billy Graham's one of his purposes in holding rallies and calling people to come forward and accept Jesus is a way to give them an event that they can look back on and remember when they became a Christian. There's nothing wrong with that. But I don't, I don't see the Bible doing that. The Bible doesn't point to the past to prove salvation. It always bases proof of salvation on evidence of the present. Uh, the Apostle John's first letter makes that very clear. First John 2, 3 points to looking at our present lives as a, a guarantee of our salvation. He says, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Just a little further on in First John, First John 3, 6 through 10. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who's born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning, because they have been born of God. That's how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. The Bible makes it clear that the internal evidence of salvation is the external evidence of salvation is that external evidence of salvation. And that external evidence of salvation is good works. And reflect the character of God. James is speaking in our passage today about the external evidences of one's faith. And he, he addresses himself to this conflict between merely agreeing to a creed, um, agreeing to a belief, and a vital 
living faith. And he contrasts in this passage a dead faith and a working faith. <clears throat> Verses 14 to 19 talks about a dead faith, and, and he begins by talking about a very shallow concern. A concern that is all talk and no action is what a shallow concern is, and it doesn't do anyone any good. A faith that is all talk and no action is a shallow faith that does you no good. Look at verse 16. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? If the only thing you can point to as evidence of your salvation is that at some point in the past you prayed a prayer years ago, maybe were baptized, but there's no reflection of the character of God in the way, in the way you seek to live. There's a cause for concern about the genuineness of your faith. Verse 17, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. The phrase by itself is literally according to itself. Such faith, that is a faith with no expression in good works, speaks for itself. And it's a dead faith. James gives a, a rather difficult example of faith by itself when he talks about a satanic confession. He says, you believe there is one God? Good. Even the de demons believe that and shudder. Demons believe in God. They know they are supposed to live the way God wants them to, and they don't. And they know that there is going to be punishment because of that. And they shudder. James makes the point here that it, he's not promoting works as the way of salvation as opposed to faith, but he's saying the person whose faith is not translated into action is no more saved than the demons who acknowledge there is a God. Such a person is doomed. I like being a teacher. I love teaching junior high kids because junior high kids think they're smart, think they can get away with anything, and they come up with these weird ideas. And one of the things I love about being a teacher is I like playing around with their minds and messing with them a little bit and getting them to, to think more than what they, they think they can. Um, and uh, one of the things that I used to do as a teacher is I would uh, I would assign projects to do school projects. Um, it's always a good idea to get the kids doing something with the material that I've taught them. I don't want to just you know give them information and have them regurgitate it onto a test, but I want them to be able to to take the the things we've been discussing and apply them to a real world situation. And and so we do you know maps and graphs and 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 storybooks and all all kinds of things to get the kids to think about and do the the work. Uh, to internalize it more than just a squared plus b squared equals c squared. You know, that's one of the things that I would always do is I would always have a list of things that I expected the kids to do during the, during the project. Um, and then I would grade them on those things. And I used to always tell kids, if you don't understand something, if you want to make sure, come and check with me. And I would be more than happy to give you some advice and to help you out. And just about every project, some kid uh, would come up to me and show me their project. And they would ask me this one particular question that I love to play around with. And, and that they would always ask me, Mr. Dixon, I want you to look at my project. Is this good enough? And I love that question. Is this good enough? And I would always look at it and I would go, well, you know, yeah, I think that's good enough. If you turn that in right now, I would give you a grade of D minus because a D minus is good enough. It's not an F. And of course, the kid would be like, what? A D minus? So yeah, you asked if it was good enough. 
And that's what I want to know. Is it good enough? Yeah, it's good enough. It's a D minus. And the kids would be like, what? Like, now, here's what I want you to do. Is I want you to ask yourself, I said, is this the best job you can do? Is this the best you can do? And they're like, um, no. I said, well, then, if it's not the best you can do, is it good enough? And they're like, uh, no. <laughs> Bingo. Good enough isn't good enough. Faith on its own isn't good enough. Even the demons have that level of faith. <clears throat> And you don't want to be in the same class as demons. James turns from this dead faith that he's talked about, people not concerned with the poor and the demons, and he turns to a working faith in verses 20 through 26. And he uses two illustrations to look at a working faith. <clears throat> the church has too many whose personal commitments to Christ is shallow and whose spiritual transformation is minimal or, or, or non-existent. On the other hand, there are some who have let works take the place of faith. In such cases, their works are not an expression of their faith, but an attempt to gain God's favor and earn salvation, which is impossible. Titus 3 5 said he saved us not because of the righteous things we have done but because of his mercy. James is writing to a, a Jewish Christian audience. When they responded to Christ they learned that they were free from the law. James makes point that while we are free from the burden of the law we're not free from the standards of the law. True faith, in fact, seeks to express itself in right living. Faith is not just a, a detached acceptance of some creed, nor is it one half of the requirement for salvation with the other being works. Rather than teaching faith plus works, James was arguing for a different kind of faith, a faith that shows it is genuine by how it is expressed. And he gives these two examples of true faith. James begins talking about this working faith by giving the illustration of a patriarch, Abraham. Verse 21 in James chapter 2. Was not our father <clears throat> Abraham? <coughs> Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? In James chapter 15, Abraham doesn't have any children, and he has designated his main uh, major domo servant, Eliezer of Damascus, as his heir, the person who's going to take over his family when he dies. But God promises Abraham that he's going to have a son in his own flesh and blood. <clears throat> Genesis 15, verse 16, the Bible tells us Abraham believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. But I find it interesting that when James looks back on this story, he doesn't use this first expression of Abraham's faith, his original experience of righteousness as an example of faith. He doesn't look back to when Abraham had this conversion experience. <clears throat> Instead, James points to a story 35 years later of Abraham being asked to offer his son Isaac as a burnt sacrifice, as evidence of Abraham's faith. Why? Because James wants to point out that faith will continue to be expressed by right response to God. In verse 22, James tells us that true faith matures and is evidenced by proper response to God. Abraham's willingness to act on his faith and offer his son Isaac demonstrates his faith in God was genuine. The current action of Abraham's faith was evidence of the genuineness of his salvation experience. 
And that's finally where James does refer back to Abraham being found righteous. His faith, expressed 35 years before, is shown to be true by his actions at that present time on the mountain with his son Isaac. Abraham didn't always get it right, but though his obedience wasn't always a, a picture of perfection, his desire was always to head in the right direction. That's a working faith. James gives us a second illustration of faith in action when he talks about Rahab, the prostitute in Jericho. We read we read Rahab's story in Joshua chapter 2 for the first part of it, and it finishes up in chapter 6. Most of us know the story. Um, Israel, the Israelites and Joshua are getting ready to attack the promised land. Um, they need to get into Israel, and uh, or what's going to become Israel. And the first place they need to conquer is the city of Jericho. And Joshua sends in two spies to scope out the land and check out the city of Jericho. They go into the city. They go to Josh to, to the house of Rahab, who's described in the Bible as a prostitute. And they ask her for assistance. And she gives it to them. She hides them. The king of Jericho discovers that they're there. He starts to chase them. They're hiding in Rahab's house. <clears throat> the king comes to Rahab's house and says, hey, bring out the people that are these spies. They're out to destroy the city. And Rahab says, um, I think they went that away or that away or that away or whatever way they went. They're not here anymore. Even though she had taken them up onto the roof of her house and hid them up there. And of course, um, the king of Jericho, the, the guards all figured out, she thought she was telling the truth, and they all took off to try and chase the spies. Rahab goes up onto the top of the house and starts to talk with the spies. And in Joshua chapter 2, verse 11, she says, when we, we, we know your God, we've heard about you guys. And she says, when we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. She expresses her faith in Israel's God. She knows God is God. And <clears throat> she asks for a favor. She asks for her and her family to be spared. And the two spies agree to that. Um, you know the rest of the story of, of the Battle of Jericho. The Israelites march around the city a whole bunch of times over a, a week period. Eventually, they turn towards the city. They shout and yell, and the walls come a-tumbling down, except for the wall <clears throat> where Rahab's house was. And Joshua <clears throat> instructs these spies to go and get Rahab and bring her and her family to him. In Joshua chapter 6, verse 25, it says, But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family <clears throat> and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lived among and she lives among the Israelites to this day. She becomes an Israelite. <clears throat> she had faith in God, and she showed that faith, that working faith, by protecting the Israelite spies. In Jewish tradition, Rahab married Joshua and became the ancestors of the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel. In the New Testament, she's listed in the ancestors of Jesus. She showed hospitality to the spies who, at first glance, would not, would not have given her any benefit. Rahab doesn't say to the spies, be warm and well fed and go on your way. Instead, she hides them and protects them. And in return, she becomes a member of God's chosen people. 
James sums it up in the final verse of the chapter. He says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. The teaching of James in this passage is a call to integrity, a call to live out the gospel. If we are true believers in God, we need to show our faith in our actions, not just some of the time, but all of the time. There's a saying uh, attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, although he probably didn't say it, but it's still a good, good statement. And supposedly he said, preach the gospel at all time. And if necessary, use words. Live your faith. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian who was arrested and killed while a prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp during World War II. Writing about faith, Bonhoeffer says, Christians must remember and live by both sides of the proposition. Only he who believes is obedient, and only he who is obedient believes. Faith without deeds is dead.